This is my 1964 Honda uh, S600. This is sort of the great grandfather of the modern Honda, the S2000. Uh, this was Honda's first real sports car. Fantastic car, 606 cc's, 57 horsepower. It revs to 9,500 RPM, roller bearing crank. You know, it's amazing. If this had Porsche written on it, it would be $250,000. But because it's Honda, uh, for some reason, they don't seem to get the respect that they deserve. But they're getting there. People are going back and starting to appreciate just how fantastic these small, lightweight cars were. It has chain drive to the rear end. What that means, you have the drive shaft goes to differential, and then chains, a chain drive on each side, which gives you kind of an independent suspension thing. And the chains make all kinds of neat noises. And when it revs to 9,500 RPM, you feel like you're in a, a Grand Prix car. Uh, this is the SM model. This is the deluxe model. This is the rarest of the S600s. It only came, uh, this color was only available in this model. It has all kinds of goofy features, like the radio antenna is actually this rod here that goes into the, uh, it, it, well, your antenna's in here. It, uh, it doesn't work. It was a nice try, but it just, uh, it just doesn't work. This is a classic example of buying a restored car and having to restore it all over again. Because uh, although it had been restored, from 20 or 30 feet it looked pretty good, but there was a lot of rust in the body. Um, the engine had not been done properly. I don't want to offend the previous owner, but it had not been done properly. We had to redo everything again. Uh, Jim uh, Hall was in charge of putting the engine together. Jim, come on in here. Uh, Jim, tell us some of the problems we had with this motor. Uh, the car was a runner. We drove it when uh, yeah. you first got it. And you asked me, it's like, there seems to be a head gasket leak. There's some liquid leaking out of the motor. Right. Uh, why don't you take a look at it? So I pulled the cylinder head off, and they'd left some seals out. Right. And once we found that, it was sort of, okay, maybe we better look a little deeper. Right, exactly. We ended up taking every nut and bolt apart on it. Yeah. Uh, found they'd put a new sleeve in that was too long. It was running into the crankshaft. Right, it was hitting. Um, and so we just went through it, made sure everything was right. Oh, and it caught fire. We forgot that. I was oh, driving yeah. one day, and I go, you know that electrical smell? It doesn't smell like anything else. And, oh, the, the air meter, uh, uh, the, the fuel gauge had just caught fire. I said, you know, let, let's go through this thing. Well, here. Here's some of the restoration. Take a look. Uh, this project you're looking at here is a Honda S600. This is a forerunner that the, cost the NSX and even the S2000. And this is one of the most... Uh, underrated cars of the 60s. Uh, these are only 606 cc's, uh, 57 horsepower, 37 foot-pounds of torque. I know it doesn't sound like much, but they really were faster than the MGs and the TR3s that had twice the size, 1,200, 1,100, even 1,500 cc. This is the chassis right here. Look how light it is. We sandblasted the chassis and had it powder coated. You know, the Japanese make fine products, but in the mid-60s, boy, their steel was not very good. Look how thin that is. It's just. So Paris cut this away, rather than fill it with Bondo, which you don't want to do, he's cut it away and he's going to put a new piece in here using fine American-made steel. Why look, the new piece of metal is in already. It's like one of those things on Martha Stewart, you know, when they take the ingredients and put it in the oven, two minutes later it's all cooked. This is actually the other side of the car. As you can see, he's cut this side away and replaced it already, so. She's going to be a brand new Honda when she's done. As you can see, we're in the paint booth. All the prep work has been done. You can see Perry did a nice job on the metal. Um, I, I can't even see where he joined it, so it's uh, <laughs> nice work. Nice Thank work. You. Where Thank else you. did we do? We did there. We did the, there. The side. We did a piece in the back Piece here. in here. Yep. And the same on the le left side. So very exciting. We're doing it in the original color. Yeah. It's kind of a teal. Is that what you're saying? I, I, yeah, turquoise, blue, yeah, yeah, green. Yeah, yeah. But it's going to be a brand new Honda 600 when we're done, so. Now we're getting ready to paint, but that's uh, where I'll leave it up to the master. Uh, I'll step out and uh, you put on your whole... Uh... Okay, so you're not going to help me? No, no, I'm not going to help you. I don't okay. know what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> Look at the size of these pistons. Very tiny. This is this is how we tune. It's how they tune engines in Japan. As you can see, this is a pretty lightweight. Everything's pretty small. It's all aluminum. It's 
are all our liners here. This is what's known as a wet liner engine. There's no ring that goes down here at the bottom of the cylinder. Cylinders press down in, water surrounds them to uh, cool the engine. Uh, back here on the crankshaft, this is really cool. Not only are these pistons tiny, but this is an all roller bearing crank. So this thing has very, very little friction, so it makes a whole lot of horsepower for the size of the engine. This is 57 horsepower now, maybe with our head work that we had done. Where's our head? Can I pull our head up here? Yeah. Okay. We just got our head back. All new valve guides and everything. You see how light this thing is. <laughs> Look how tiny the valves are. They also double as golf tees. There's the transmission here. Here's your rear end. This has a chain drive rear end. See, your transmission goes, your drive shaft here. Now what you have, you have a shaft here which goes to a chain, there's a chain, a sprocket rather, sprocket here, so you have chain drive to both rear wheels. So you get kind of a, kind of an independent suspension thing. It's pretty neat the way it works. It's lightweight, it's very efficient. Uh, the engine itself, there's the engine that's lying around here somewhere, 600 cc's, revs to 9,500. 9,500 is a red line, the thing will go 11,000. Don't forget, this is 1964. So it's great fun to drive. It just screams. Nothing happens under seven grand. Uh, and the cool thing is it's all roller bearings. So there's no oil pressure gauge in the thing because it's a roller bearing, needle bearing uh, uh, bottom end on it. And the only other thing that had needle roller bearings or anything like that was the Porsche uh, four camera. So it, it's, it's pretty cool, it's pretty sophisticated. It's a great combination of motorcycle and automotive technology. The body is all uh, painted and been finished. We found a fantastic guy to do our stainless steel. They uh, straightened it all out. I will, uh, in one of the under the hood segments, we will uh, show you how they do that. But this was all dented and smashed. This is all the original chrome and all the original trim. And we sent it to this buddy of mine and he straightened it all out. Uh, steering wheel's been done. That was kind of a rush job, not perfect, but it looks pretty good. Uh, engine is waiting to go in, side panels are in, glass is in here. We got a new windshield coming. As you can see, our engine compartment is this, uh, well, I think about as good as we can make it. The muffler that was on this car was all rusted out. So the Flowmaster guys made this up for us. So we're gonna made up the original stuff for this Flowmaster muffler. And then new tailpipes out to go to the back. You know, the car's basically done. Right now we're down, we have to do this muffler uh, assembly for it. I don't want to say we wouldn't have been able to do this restoration without Brian Baker of uh, Formula H Motor Works out of Middletown, New York. He's the uh, the S600, S800 guru, and if you want to find out more about these cars, you can go to formulah.com. That's his shop, and he's got parts and things available. Uh, I think he's a little mad at me because we put these high-performance carburetors on. We had the stock carburetors, but before we, uh, but because we did some head work to it, uh, polish it and poured it and all that stuff, we're getting a little more horsepower, a little more gas. So we're not at 57 horsepower. It might be somewhere like. 65. Ooh. But don't laugh. It, it goes it, it goes pretty good. Uh, Jim, you want to tell some other stuff about this motor? It's like a mini Grand Prix engine. Right. It's, it's neat to get into it because with the roller bearing crank and, and uh, the twin overhead cams and uh, bucket tappets and all that sort of stuff, it was... When I first started it, it sounded like a DFV, a Cosworth motor yeah. when you fired the thing up. We spent hours here working till midnight on this motor to get it all done and it, it just works like a swiss watch yeah and as much as i like english sports cars in the 50s and 60s uh this car is really so far superior to the midgets or the, or the sprites of the period not only did you have uh, a 9500 rpm redline uh, cars today still don't have that but you had roll-up windows you had a top uh you had a heater although that sounds silly now in the 50s and 60s, when you bought your typical English sports car, you didn't get a lot of those things. As you can see, it's got a full trunk, and I mean, it's a great, great little car. And, I mean, there is somewhat of a 
mean, I tend to look like a circus bear driving it, but that's okay. I don't mind looking like a circus bear because it's a lot of fun. So I guess the next step is probably to uh, take it for a ride. We'll take her out and get her nice and toasty first, get her warmed up. Important thing with these small, high revving motors, you want to make sure your oil and your temperature is warm. As you can see, it is a tiny car, but it's not that tiny in the inside. There's actually, I think there's actually more room there is in, than there is in a Sprite or a Midget. Now, if you listen carefully, you can kind of hear the chains in the rear. Some people might find it annoying, but if you're an enthusiast, you like, just like the whole cornucopia of sound that comes with an engine like this. You know, a little engine screaming its head off is a lot more exciting than a big engine moving slowly, you know? At least it is to me. Because with this thing, you really have to wring every last bit of power out of it. And that's where the fun comes. You know, going quickly in a slow car is actually more fun than, than uh, going fast in a fast car. Because anybody can go fast in a fast car. When you take a car that's essentially not that powerful and make it do things uh, that it's not supposed to be able to do, well, that, that's where the real fun is. But we're still waiting for our temperature to come up. They're a little cold-blooded. See, we're still on 50. And obviously, I'm sitting on the left, on the right-hand side, because this is a Japanese car. Uh, this car was never officially imported to America. Some GIs brought them back, of course. I think this one went to Canada because it says fuel and temperature in English. And it's in kilometers, which is uh, Canadian as well as Japanese. All right, our temperature gauge has come up. We're about up to normal. So we can start to uh, bring the revs up a little bit. Still got to fix my gas gauge. Don't worry about that. We're just broken. 1964 was a wonderful time for the Japanese in America. America had been flooded with Japanese transistor radios. I had one of them. In fact, I snuck one into math class once, and Mrs. Parker, my math teacher, said, oh, is that a Japanese radio? And smashed it on the ground. Uh, something to do with the war. Wonderful little gearbox. Like all my gearboxes, I run MTL, that manual transmission loop. Stuff works great. This car weighs maybe a little bit more than the Lotus Elan. It is all steel. It's probably, uh, it's about 1,600 pounds, maybe 1,600 and change. But wonderfully sophisticated. Uh, just an amazing, amazing car for the price and for the time. I mean, think about it. 9,500 RPM Redline in 1964. Most cars today, even the Ferraris and Lamborghinis, don't go anywhere near that. And it's a wonderful sound. You don't even need the radio. Not that you could hear it. You really get used to sitting on the other side pretty quickly. This car is so small, it doesn't make any difference which side you sit on. Next to the McLaren F1 and the Porsche Carrera, this is the best sounding car. If you're wondering why there's no oil pressure gauge on the dash, because it's got a roller bearing crank. Don't need an oil pressure gauge with a roller bearing crank. The only thing you can use is the fifth gear. Turn it seven, eight grand on the freeway, <laughs> it's pretty loud. couple of years there's been a new newfound respect for a lot of these early Japanese cars the 240z the 1600 in fact my first sports car ever was the Datsun 1600 then they had the 2000 after that then of course the Mazda Cosmo terrific engineering coming out of Japan in the 60s well if I'm gonna make Mount Fujiyama I better leave now see you later Mm-hmm. <laughs>